Okay, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel, um, and this is uh, Corona Watch, is it? Or Community Matters make it. It's all the same these days. In fact, everything we do is about Corona Watch, I tell you the truth. And everything everybody does is about Corona Watch. It occupies all of our time and thought, and it occupies the media right up to the top. So we are very lucky today to have uh, Keith Vieira. He's a leader in the hotel and tourism industry. Uh, he's here in our studio, and we are so happy to be able to ask him questions about what is going on in tourism and hospitality and hotels and all the ancillary industries and businesses that are that are dependent on tourism here in our essentially our mono economy state. Welcome to the show, Keith. Thank you very much. So uh, you know you've been right in the middle of this. You've seen it coming from all sides, and uh, I'm so curious to know, you know, how you feel first. How do you feel, Keith? Um, I think scared. Uh, we've never seen anything of this magnitude this quickly. Uh, you know, after 9-11, we knew that would be major, but nothing has changed as much so quickly in what we've seen in the last three or four days. So, and the impact to the community on the trickle down from, you know, it's one thing to run, uh, you know, 50% occupancy, but it's a whole other thing when you close hotels. So uh, I, I think it's really uncharted waters for us. Well, I don't think people realize uh, exactly what it means to close a hotel or close a restaurant. Can you describe, I mean, suppose, for example, I, I, get, um, I get an order to close a hotel and I'm the man manager, general manager of the hotel. What do I have to do? Where do I start? I mean, it's probably something I have never done before, yeah? Uh, what do I do? Well, I think the... the Tricky part has been uh, last week, hotels were looking at, well, maybe we need to look at 10% uh, drop in business, 20% drop in business, or 30% drop in business. And that really went on until Sunday or Monday of this week. And then all of a sudden, when the mass cancellations came in relative to uh, some of the things the president has said, some of the things the local governors have said, such as Ige yesterday about tourism, tourism uh, not being uh, carried on here, um, that changes the ball game. So when you look at what you're going to uh, close, you have to pick a time frame that is going to make some sense. And I think most hotels are saying, okay, hopefully this is 30 days, because that kind of dictates what level of staffing you need during that closure period. You obviously want your sales department kind of prepared to sell for the future, but you don't want them calling customers. So what do they do? Uh, you obviously have the ongoing maintenance and cleanliness of the hotel that's important. But a lot of hotels, even today, are still running 50% because people haven't left yet on their return trips. Mm -hmm. Now, that's going to change in the next couple of days. Yeah. Um, but right now, if your restaurants are closed and you're here on vacation, what an awful experience. So to answer your question really about the timing, it probably takes you three to four days to put your whole plan together. And most of the brand companies have been through this before or have plans for it. Uh, and they're helping the, the local management teams get that done. And then it would probably take three to four days to implement the actions. But there's so many unknowns relative to the employees, which are really the shame of this whole thing is what uh, it's going to happen to these employees. You know, they're medical. Is this a layoff? Is it a furlough? Is it paid time off? So those things are being dealt with right now. And I think in the next two or three days, conversations with the unions, conversations with parent companies as far as how do we do our best for those employees. Yeah, I can see that as a major problem because a lot of them don't have the resources to carry on without a job for any or pay for any length of time. So let's talk about losses for a minute. I mean, I hate to have this conversation with you, but here we are. And I think we have to belly up to a, a number of issues like this. The hotels um, are not going to make revenue in the period of closure. That's one thing. Nobody's coming around. And there are subsidiary businesses in the lobbies and the restaurants. They're not going to make any money either. So all of that is a, a, a dead loss. What about the people who have paid uh, for reservations, uh, you know, going forward and who have given the hotels money or have given their credit card you know, money? Um, what happens to that? Is it refunded or is it put on in abeyance? What happens? Uh, different companies have different policies. It's going to be refunded or credited. Uh, I think it's going to depend on the time frame. Uh, if this is, you know, 30 days or 30 to 40 days, then I think credited makes some sense. But when you have cases where this could be much longer or people have put up major sums, you're going to have to do something that shows sympathy to their situation. And I think companies are evaluating this daily. My feeling is by the end of all of this, there'll be full refunds for most of this that has happened. The group business that was canceling uh, in the prior two weeks, I think that's a different story because they still could have come. Um, and there'll be legal issues relative to that. But for the individual 
in essence, almost every company is refunding uh, deposits right now. Yeah, and I can see it from the, the view of the, uh, of the, of the guest. Uh, uh, we all know this is beyond the control of anybody, really, although we wish the United States had done things earlier and more thoughtfully. Um, and uh, uh, we know that he's, uh, he's got a certain interest in this brand. He likes this brand or he wouldn't have made the reservations. He wouldn't have, he wouldn't have come to this hotel. Now he's like, he's, he's, his nerves are jangled. Um, he's worried about everything, as we all are. Um, and the treatment he gets from this hotel and what he paid is really going to determine his view of that brand for the rest, may I say, for the rest of his life. So how the hotel handles this, how they handle each customer, or refunds or credits, whatever it may be, the, the tone of the letters and emails that go out, this is going to determine, uh, in large part, you know, uh, the, the business of the future, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, you're, you're dead on right. Um, a brand is a promise and you expect to be treated certain ways. And I think certain companies, I can tell by the direct, uh, the emails that I get, uh, have really stepped up to the plate. I think Marriott's done a good job in communicating both to their customers and their frequent travelers. And I think Marriott has about 120 million frequent travelers. So I think they've done a good job educating them along the way. And about every three or four days, the information comes out. So that's gonna be key is communication is, is critical. Uh, just someone as a corollary discussion, I was supposed to be staying in Las Vegas arriving yesterday. And on Sunday, I was calling the hotel to find out what was open. And they said, well, two restaurants. And by five hours later, the whole strip was shut down. So you better reach out to those customers. One, apologize for the timing of it. Make sure you're showing their best interests at heart. Make sure you talk about the employees that are, are really bearing the brunt of all of this, both the direct employees and the ancillary down the chain. Uh, and then continue communicating. And when we come out of this, I think you're gonna see a lot of value added offers for people uh, to take advantage and, and uh, enjoy things again. We saw this after 9-11. Uh, people immediately realize, I want to get it with my family. I want to go out on vacation. And Hawaii, because the whole world is going through this, Hawaii, I think, will be the prime destination where they want to re rejuvenate, uh, regroup with their family, and celebrate the passage of uh, perhaps a very difficult time in our history. Yeah, gee, that's a, that's a very interesting point. Gee, I see it the same way, too. When all this is over and the coast is clear, uh, people are going to want to, you know, kick their heels a little. They're going to want to take a vacation. They've been cooped up, you know, under these quarantine requirements. Now it's time to live a little and they'll come right back here, all of them, as long as we can assure them that A, right. we're over the hump and B, we're ready for them, you know, because it's hard to get it started again, which we'll talk about later in the show. But let's, uh, let's talk about, um, you know, during the period of down, you, you referred to this earlier, you have fixed costs. The hotel has fixed costs. It has, to, it has to meet in order to preserve the property, so to speak. Um, so many, so many things. I'm sure that if you looked at a budget for any of these hotels, the, the costs would be huge and they would not be dependent on the number of guests. They would be just to maintain the property. So they have to come up with bucks to pay those costs on an ongoing basis. I mean, maybe some of the, some of the vendors would forgive them, but I think mostly the vendors are suffering themselves. Right. <laughs> you, need, you need to pay, keep them in business. But uh, uh, go ahead, sorry. No, I was going to say uh, absolutely because, you know, Hawaii has been under a lot of pressure to work with local vendors, as they should. And so many of them have contracts with Waimanalo farmers for their produce. Uh, you know, cleaning supplies and some of the national things, well, that's, that's generally done through national purchasing and they may not be as effective. But for the little guys operating mom and pop operations, operating unique product for the rooms, it could be... Uh, unique smells, the different things that infuses the people put in the room, they're the ones that are gonna, they can't survive. They, their inventory cannot sit on the shelf. So that's gonna be a major problem. As far as planning for it, many hotels have gone through a renovation to the level of they have to close. Oh, sure. uh, you know, Royal Hawaiian a couple of years ago was closed for uh, I think about uh, 17 months. And so you have some experience of what needs to be done going forward, the maintenance that needs to take, take place. But at the end of the day, uh, you can do everything possible to try to keep people employed, but your but bulk of your employees, especially your line employees, are not going to be employed. Uh, and that's what scares me now. It, it's very easy to close things. It's very, very easy to tell people, don't go out. We're going to lock, you know, you got to stay undercover. Um, but what about those employees who have bills to pay? 
Yeah, and what about those employees who um, who sort of give it up? They're, they're so down about this, they go look for other jobs. I'm not saying they're going to get other jobs, but they may find other ways to live their life. And so when somebody calls them a month later, they say, sorry, we're not, I'm not available anymore. I, I'm not here. You know, I went to the mainland, whatever. I went to Asia, who knows what, um, but I'm not here. So then you have to recoup you know, and fill those pukas and find people who are somewhat skilled and who can continue to operate the hotel. That's not so easy. It's hard, it's hard enough to find staff without this kind of problem, but this is going to be a significant problem, isn't it? Yeah, it's a major problem. And plus the hotels, as all the industry here, this isn't just about serving coffee or meals. It really is a sense of aloha. It really is understanding the history and culture of the place and making sure you emanate that to people and your guests. And even uh, the employees that are from foreign countries, uh, they love talking about their history. They love talking about their relatives that maybe came over uh, to work the plantations and then eventually moved over to the hotels, et cetera. So, this is not that simple where we need to hire another, a new 10,000 employees. We need these employees back. We need their positive you know, energy back, but we need to help them survive during that process. Yeah, just another reason to help them in that process so that they don't, they don't go off and, and not be available later. Um, the other thing that comes to mind, and this is, this is a conversation that could take a while, but uh, just to summarize my view of it, you have, you have um, you know, this is the biggest industry in the state, for sure, by, by multiples, and it has been for a long time. Um, and so just, just thinking loosely, you got taxi cabs, um, you got restaurants out there in the community, you got, you got tour companies, you got all kinds of events and things that happen uh, that not only draw upon the tourist market, but that are dependent on it. And if you shut the hotels down, such as the administration has shut them down in the state, um, then you, you're essentially shutting down the whole connected infrastructure of all of those businesses, all of those um, mom and pops, all of those employees and staff. Um, can you give me some idea of the depth and breadth of the effect of that, of that action on this, these ancillary businesses? Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, because you have one, you have the full-time employee, uh, and, and they have to deal with, you know, maybe they can get unemployment and, and maybe there's some help from the union. So you have some of that. But there are so many workers that work two or three part-time jobs. And if you lose one of your part-time jobs, it could be banquets on weekends. It could be, uh, as you said, taxi cab drivers, uh, Uber drivers, et cetera. When you lose that part that you're counting on, but that's what helps you survive every month, and it's not that simple just to get another job because those jobs really aren't available as much outside of tourism. It's going to be brutal for them. Uh, if it's 30 days, I think people will get by. Uh, if this goes on for 60, 90, or perhaps even longer, they're not going to get by. Um, and there really isn't a catch-all system. Um, you know, you can try to deal with the uh, benefits and uh, you know, medical and other areas like that. But at the end of the day, the money that's needed to buy food, to uh, pay rent or the various things they need to do, it's just not gonna be there. Uh, the scope is, is huge. Yeah, and it is a major crisis for the state, economically for sure. But going back to the hotels now, um, if you said 30, 60, 90, I mean, we have no way of knowing it sort of depends on how good we are in following the rules. It depends on how, how many people we let in or don't let in, how we contain, whether we find the masks uh, to test people, whether we find, um, you know, the, the medical equipment to save them. Uh, all these things are up in the air, I have to say. And uh, we're not really prepared to deal with, uh, you know, the supply of masks or surgical gowns or respirators or hotel beds and all that stuff. And so this will ultimately be the factor uh, that uh, tells us how long this is going to last. I think personally, I'd, I'd be interested in your view of this. I think 30 days is really, really optimistic because it was still going up. So are other countries. The only country that has actually slowed down, ironically enough, is China. Or so they say. <laughs> <laughs> it's ironic. Um, but, you know, 60 days also seems a little bit, you know, uh, so if, if I were a, a prudent hotel planner, I think you are, um, then what do I really plan for here? Is it the summer? Is it the end of the year? What I'm looking for is like the tipping point, the point where we start having less case, fewer cases, a point where you don't have to worry about walking down the street and picking up, picking up the virus. Yeah, I, 
I think the hotels are going to look at if we can ramp up in 30 days, is it 60, is it 90? And you really have three different plans because on the short term, it's going to be, you have to work. The other thing is that Hawaii is so dependent on our partners. No matter what we do uh, as a hotel industry, if the airlines don't correlate and have an increase in seats, that's not going to work. Uh, if all of our tour operators, which have been big supporters, whether it be JTB or Pleasant Hawaiian Holidays, over the years, a lot of people still trust them to package them. For example, Pleasant is owned by AAA of Southern California. They have 59 million members. So we're going to have to partner with those kind of partners who sell Hawaii and get an offering in, in the market. Um, I tend to think as we go through what we're going through with the medical situation on a parallel sheet of paper uh, needs to be done. All the steps we're going to do to ramp back up when we find out that there is some good news in terms of controlling this disease uh, or some things that we can look at in terms of time frame. But you're going to have three different programs because it's going to look at uh, three different time dates because it's going to really affect your employees, your marketing plan. You can't go and market now or even 30 days when people are coming yeah. off of this huge suffering. Uh, but you also just can't wait for the market to come back. Whoever's first in the market is probably going to do best. So you have different levels of the plan on different dates, and then you plan to implement it as you go along. The way the news has been coming in so incredibly quick on what's going on, um, you know, that may help you respond quicker than would be a normal situation. Yeah, I think it's on top of mind for everybody. Uh, but that's a good segue for a break. Let's take a short break and come back and talk about the recovery how that's going to unfold and what we can do now to prepare for it, what we can do then to prepare for it. As Keith Vieira, a hotel manager and, and guru and uh, a hotel expert par excellence, are going to help us understand what's happening in tourism. We'll be right back. Okay, we're back. We're live with Keith Vieira here on Community Matters, talking about the hotel industry and all the ancillary businesses around it and how they are doing in the crisis, the corona crisis. Uh, and now the most important part, I think, is to see at the end of the tunnel to try to plan for it, to try to, you know, mm, clean it all up so that people want to come here again and we can sort of reestablish our global brand and our global tourism industry. So, Keith, are you, what are you working on now? And how do you see the interim period uh, as an opportunity to develop a recovery? Um, you have to have your plan in place. And uh, I believe HTA is working on a general marketing fund on a certain amount. Uh, I think the industry will come in with probably five or six times that uh, and be ready to go. But what's going to be important is that we speak with one voice. We need to get the message out led by H, uh, HTA and HVCB about Hawaii is a safe, comfortable, welcoming place to be. You really highlight our brands of the Aloha Spirit, uh, and I think it's going to be value-added offers. I sure hope that hotels don't start all cutting rates because it's going to take us years and years to recover if they do that. But if you take whatever rates would have been typical for this time of year and you include uh, a third night free or you include uh, certain dining dollars or you include uh, free activities, free luau or different things that's going to enhance their stay. Uh, and then that way, when the market recovers, you can just take away some of the free offers and go back to normality. Um, you know, it may sound a little bit callous. You're worried about rate when we're on the worst possible time. But this is survival. I mean, this is survival for the long run. And Hawaii is an expensive place to do business. We get some of the highest ADRs in the world because our product is worth it. But because we have owners putting hundreds of millions into the product continually and trying to improve it. We have some of the highest wages in the U.S. We have some of the highest benefit costs in the U.S. And our employees deserve it because they work hard in a destination that runs 85 to 90 percent occupancy. So I think it's going to be um, absolutely critical that we try to get things back to somewhat of a normality as soon as possible. One area that will probably benefit as a, uh, as a leisure destination, we're only about a 17 percent group 
uh, business. You know, I wish that was much higher, 30% over time. But right now, destinations like Las Vegas and other strong group destinations are going to have a much harder time coming back because the groups aren't going to book right away. It's going to take a while. So I do think we can really drive leisure visitors. And I think in a 60-day period, assuming the airline seats are there, we can get back to some kind of normality after the start of it. So 60 days after the 60 that you have to go through what we went through. Well, indeed, it, it is survival. You mentioned that. And I think it's not only survival of the industry here and all the ancillary businesses, survival, but it's also survival of the state. Because as, as tourism goes, so goes the state of Hawaii. No question about it. That's a, a clearly established rule. So query, in the meantime, uh, we can't afford to lose you. The state cannot afford to lose you. Uh, is the industry seeking a bailout? Is it seeking special, special um, you know, funding from the state or the Fed? Um, I think they're going to look at that. Right now, you're just trying to deal with what goes on every day. Some of the major hotel companies are dealing with, uh, have met with uh, the president and looking at what can be done as the airline industry. But what we need here is local leadership. You know, I remember after 9-11, Walter Dodds calling me and saying, uh, I, got, I want the five mayors, I want all the heads of the hotel companies, we're going to Japan, we're going to visit every major customer there, and we're going to talk to them and ask them to come back to Hawaii. You know, that's the kind of leadership we need. I noticed the other day on the governor's committee, he had Peter Ho, and Peter Ho said, we better be putting together a marketing plan. Uh, we're funded by, you know, strong, cohesive dollars that we can get back into the marketplace when this is over. So that kind of leadership from the business community, that kind of leadership from uh, government, that kind of leadership from the community is going to be crucial because no one segment can do it alone. Uh, we're going to have to get back to people, and I think, in the, at the end of the day, when you put in Hawaii in front of people, they'll generally choose us nine times out of ten, putting aside the issues with cost and distance. But if they can go anywhere in the world, they want to come here. Well, you know, one of the things it seems to me is exactly what the condition of the state is at the time, you know, we, we, we sound the all, all clear signal. You know, for example, if there's any issue about a continuing um, epidemic, continuing contagion, uh, that's a real problem because I think the biggest marketing message that you could ever give is it's safe come right. here it's it's safe again you don't have to worry about it uh this place is completely under control and you can have the brand that you were looking for before that we all had before uh but how do you do that and when do you do that and to whom do you do that well you got to be very careful i mean we have a saying here bocce you know the minute you talk safe we have no <laughs> terrorists sure. you have none of that bocce gonna get you so right. you try to talk more about the experience um but i think everybody's going to come out of this with a greater sense of the importance of cleanliness. Um, you know, when you go on cruise ships, there's hand sanitizer everywhere you go. We're going to have a lot more of that. Um, allowing the homeless to be living on the pavilions in Waikiki when the restaurants are going to be closed and you have to do takeout. I mean, that's just crazy. So I hope we take this opportunity to really institute a much higher level of cleanliness so that people feel more comfortable on an ongoing basis because today it's this virus. It could always be something else at another time. Um, so I think that part is going to, you know, probably stay with us uh, at least uh, hopefully for a while. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, one, one thing that um, interests me is uh, something that you said when you came down to our program, what, three or four years ago? I don't know if you remember. Yeah. Um, and it was this whole thing about relating the industry to the community. Uh, that was your that was your most important memorable point to me. That's what you spoke about. Uh, how how do we make the industry relate to the community? How do we make the community relate to the industry? Because over the years, you know, it, it hasn't been perhaps as close as we would have wanted it to be. Um, and there are things that we can do, could do, and hopefully will do that will bond us up closer, make, make us appreciate, and make the hotel industry appreciate the community maybe better than before. So. At the, at the same time, people say, when we're finished with this epidemic, things are going to be different. I know I can tell you my life is going to be different. My family's life is going to be different. I'm going to have a different view of the world. I'm going to appreciate every day of being alive more, hopefully, when this is over. So my question to you is, how is this going to change, if at all? You mentioned a number of changes that will take place within the hotel tourism industry. Uh, can you speak more about the change, say, in the mind of the community, the change in terms of the relationship of the community? Is it going to change? And if so, how? Um, you know, when you think about we've had yearly growth since the, re since the recession was over in 2008, 2009, um, and the community was just getting the brunt of it by the rent-a-cars and everything else going on. But when you dig into that, 
we had 56,000 hotel rooms uh, 10 years ago when we had 7 million visitors. And today we have 57,000 uh, hotel rooms when we have 10 million visitors. So I think what's happened in the last three or four years is the huge growth in alternative accommodations uh, has really, in a way, hurt the perception of the industry because all of a sudden tourists are all around people. They're at the beach, they're partying by the pool at night. Uh, there's 10 people in a house that normally has two people. So uh, I hope we can separate this issue and people, I think people will again understand how important tourism is and that may scare them a little bit, but they're also gonna realize that over time we're pretty consistent and we've had good growth uh, and acceptance of the product. But the industry has got to find a way to work with the communities to get a hold on the uh, a hold of these alternative accommodations and make sure it's what the community wants. Some areas may want them, some other areas may not want them. I think that's up to the community. But we have to be careful because airlines needs you know need passengers and seats. Um, there's a lot of restaurants that do business and a lot of shops and retail that do business with this. But I think it's going to be an opportunity for us to get a hold of this issue that. It's very, you know, you have people on, clearly on, on both sides of it. For some people who make money by doing this, it's very important. So we need to get a hold of that. But I think on the overall basis, people are going to realize how important tourism is to the state. Maybe yeah. even Lee Cataluna. <laughs> Absolutely. We're all going to have to get on board because it's the driver. So the other thing that comes to mind in the same vein is, uh, so we have a certain balance between Waikiki and the neighbor islands. The neighbor islands have some fabulous hotels. Sometimes the, uh, the people in that island like the hotels, sometimes they don't like them, you know, but it's always a source of, uh, of, of jobs and revenue for them. Um, and I wonder if you see any changes in that balance going forward. When we come out the other side, uh, how is the industry going to be spread around the state? It will be the same or different? Um, I think because of the physical issues and the cost of building anything in Hawaii, I don't think it will be physically much different. Uh, but I do think there's going to be a need to incorporate more into the community with our product uh, and also um, have people experience uh, what Hawaii has to offer. Now, one of the reasons they come is they do some of that with getting ice shave in Haleiwa or go paddling into the sandbar in Kaneohe Bay. We just have to find a way that locals are accepting of that so that we don't infringe on their spot in Kaneohe that we don't uh, uh, take their beach spot that they go to. So uh, it's not easy to do, but I think we're going to get a sense of, as this grows back up, let's do it better and let's do it right this time. It's an opportunity. So last question, Keith, you know, you're obviously involved in this up to your eyeballs. I, I wonder what your personal, you know, agenda and expectation is uh, on how you can participate in making this recovery mo mo most efficient. Um, I just want... Um, we're going to have to get to in the next two to three weeks, I think 60, 70 percent of the hotels in the state will close, if not more, especially if this continued bad news comes forward and they find the virus being spread by airborne or other issues that are, that are going on. So it's going to clearly get worse before it gets better. Uh, it's going to force government to come up with uh, more plans to help people be able to remain financially, I don't want to say whole, but survive. Uh, you know, if this Senate bill goes through and people get sent a check of $1,000 on April 6th, well, that's a good start. Uh, the benefit side of it is one that scares me because of the cost of, of benefits. But um, I think that's going to have to happen. Um, for me, I want to work with people who want to talk about the recovery um, because we will get through this. Um, and when we do, we need to be the first to market. We need to continue to put Hawaii in that positive light. I mean, there's, you could travel anywhere in the world and when you say Hawaii, ah, the smile and that beautiful, wonderful place, we have to make sure we don't lose that and perhaps find a few more ways to enhance that uh, so that visitors do want to come here and spend the $18 billion they were going to spend this year uh, on an ongoing basis. Not necessarily the number of visitors, but visitor spending has to continue to grow. Uh, Keith Vieira makes my heart pound. Thank you so <laughs> much for coming down. Uh, a hotel leader, a tourism industry in Hawaii, and uh, I hope we can meet again and, and follow up in the weeks to come. Thank Sounds you so good. much, Keith. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Aloha.